Start the live event. No, what do I see there? I'll be over here. Give me a second. Very hard to open. There's. Okay, there it is. Let's pause this. And let's go pause this. We don't need to waste all that data. And. <laughs> hey, everybody! Hey, this is a quick live stream without much uh, a heads up, so, um, but hey, people are showing up, so kind of cool. <laughs> totally spontaneous this evening, basically. It's kind of hard to see, but it's dark and drizzly out all day here. Yeah, so we, we were about to head out for a walk and look for dinner and do other things this evening and actually do some filming. We were hoping to film about our stay here in um, New Smyrna Beach. New Smyrna Beach. And as soon as we were about to head out the door, it started raining again. And so Sheree's like, hey, let's do a live stream. And, you know, quickly scrambled within the last 15 minutes to get the computer set up and the camera set up and finished with about 30 seconds to spare. What, where's, uh, does, is this our audio this here? Is the, this is the so microphone. So not the, not the directional microphone. No, the, not the directional the microphone that's pointing the other way. Okay, yeah. cool. Although the new version of the software will let us use that. I just didn't have time to set that up. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, yeah, so... I kind of just came up with, I mean, we're loving uh, our stay here in New Smyrna Beach, and we've loved so many of our other marina stays over the past year. We're going on almost a year and a half now being cruisers, oh, which is pretty cool. still broadcasting the will be live soon piece. We probably could take that off. Because we are live. And yes, we are live. And who are we? Oh, okay. well, yeah, I'm Cherie. <laughs> and that I'm Chris. Chris. Yes. And you'll probably see the cat in the background. She's giving herself a bath right now. Yes. And yeah, so let's just leave that off. <laughs> and just okay. Yeah. Can you go back to here? Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just kind of proposed that maybe we just talk about city life and how that's different from RVing. So, and, and we knew this was going to be a big difference going into it, but now that we've been doing it for over a year, we really are. It's really sinking in. Um, when you're in an RV park, even a, a so-called urban RV park, you're usually not close to downtown other than pecan grove in austin which there's, is like the one exception there's there's probably some exceptions around the country where your rv park is close in walking distance to restaurants and the historical centers of downtowns and then the really cool areas but that's definitely an exception to the norm yeah well no, no not the really cool areas because oftentimes the rv parks are at the cool natural areas like you're you're right mm -hmm. in the middle of the grand canyon or next to um, you know, in sight of uh, Half Dome and Yosemite and stuff like that. But you're out in nature. But we're finding with marinas, you're often right in downtown. Because a lot of towns grew up around the waterfront um, just because of history. Before roads and before railroads, that's how things came to all these coastal towns. And so now a lot of those waterfronts have been redeveloped and have municipal marinas. And we're loving them. And these municipal marinas are like... Literally, we are like two blocks from the historical downtown of New Smyrna Beach right here. We can walk to like two breweries. One is a local brewery where the, brews, the beer's made right here. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a beer tap with like 40, 50, 100 tap 50 tap beers on tap. Crazy. Yeah. But, but Restaurants, yeah. mm -hmm. a gym. Yeah, and live music and events. And so like just being, being you know, we show up here and we're like, oh, this, this is... You know, we show up at an RV park, we try to find those cool things, but we might go out and do one day, like do our outing day to go explore the town, but it's a drive. It might be 15 minutes, it might be 30 minutes, might, sometimes it might even be longer than that to get to town. Whereas here, it's just like, oh, hey, feel like going for a walk? Yeah, let's walk down, walk through downtown again. And then we stumble on like a, a live music thing that's going <laughs> on that we hadn't heard about yeah. or um, an art festival. Like this down here in a New Smyrna Beach since we've been here the last month. Uh, we've had an arts and craft fair. We've had a antique automobile show. We've had like three summer free concerts. We're we here had for a bed of race. The, bed race, the, yeah, that the was downtown fun. bed races. You know, pushing beds through, um, and just this stuff to stumble across. And this is actually a pretty small town. Um, you know, we, we we Fort Myers last year. This time last year was a, a much bigger town and had a lot going on. Um, we actually were in the heart of Miami for a bit too. So we've we've got to experience all these different sizes and scales of town. But the one constant for them has been they're generally walking distance from where we can stay in our floating house which makes it a lot easier because towing a car behind a boat is a little more difficult uh, than 
and sort yeah. of our RV. So we don't often have our car with us. Now, when we know we're planning a longer term stay, we will still arrange sometimes to get the Mini Cooper to us. Um, it is currently in Central Florida, and we have at some of our stops been able to bring the Mini to, to us, and that's mm -hmm. given us more mobility. Um, but it's like here in the Smyrna Beach, it would have been no big deal to go get the Mini from here. I and we didn't, missed it, and really. I haven't missed it at all. Today was actually the first time we even bothered to use a lift to get around because we wanted to go see a play um, that got rained out. Or, thundered uh, out. Thundered out, lightning <laughs> lightning, and power outaged out, and then to do some groceries. Um, but other than that, pretty much everything we've wanted to do, we've been able to, to do walking distance. Or bumming a ride from somebody. Or, or borrowing cars. Um, we, we found that other long-term cruisers and marinas are sometimes very willing to loan out a car, as have we when we've had yeah. our car. Mm -hmm. We've loaned our car out to other cruisers. Um, my mom uh, comes to visit, so we usually time uh, stock-up runs with uh, visits mm -hmm. from mom. That usually works really well. But, you know, sitting, staying in these city marinas is also a very affordable way to stay in downtowns. That is, m marinas live up to the reputation of being expensive for overnights. Um, but once you get to the weekly or particularly the monthly rates, suddenly marinas start to get competitive, if not cheaper, than RV parks we're discovering, mm -hmm. which is fabulous. And, oh. Uh, so marinas, they charge by the foot, whether you're, it's <laughs> daily, nightly. Very rarely do you find where they just, it's a flat rate. Right. They are out there. We haven't encountered them yet outside yeah, of Florida yet. Um, but mostly they're by the foot. So uh, the rates we're finding for daily are ranging anywhere from $1.25 to $3.50 per foot, plus taxes, plus usually an electrical charge. So yes. we've been paying anywhere between, I think the lowest we paid is like $70. We're 47 Which feet. Yeah, which, which in the RV world, that would have been like a big splurge for us. And, and I was like, oh boy, only $70. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and usually those kind of parks are not the ones we want to stay at. It's, you know, we, we like the, the more basic campgrounds. Um, but in the marinas, that, that is cheap for our rig our size. Um, but, you know, so we're, if we're paying, staying somewhere nice, sometimes it's, you know, we're paying 100 bucks, 150 bucks a night. Uh, for a stop and for an overnight we just we just have to budget that in because sometimes anchorages just aren't available so when we're cruising oh. we're anchoring out a lot mm -hmm. and which is easy it's just the equi RVing equivalent of boondocking and it's it's free and it's fabulous and whatnot you provide your own electricity um so yeah so these these daily stops get a little pricey we'll do like one you know it's it's you, f you feel really bad paying for more than a night or two at a time um but we'll do that if that we'll is the it. best option for us to explore in the city particularly if you want to explore someplace like when we did downtown fort lauderdale it's yeah, of course we're in fort lauderdale we want to be able to walk off our boat and be in right downtown again mm -hmm. another great downtown experience but then once you start to factor in a lot of these places if they have availability have weekly rates which the weekly rates Sometimes it's the equivalent of five or six days. So you're basically getting one or two nights free. Very similar to RV parks yeah. as well, uh, private RV parks. But then once you jump to the monthly rates, sometimes a month is cheaper than two, two weeks. weeks. <laughs> uh, so if you're like, if you if you want to be someplace for two weeks, you might as well stay an entire month or at least know that you have that option. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened here in New Smyrna Beach is we had already extended to two weeks because we had to wait for some packages to meet up with us. And we were already like falling in love with the city and just the access that we had here, the people here. It was just a great experience all around. And when they said, well, I can, I'll be happy to charge you for a couple of days, but if you extend for a month, you just extend the, your reservation out for a month and basically add on an extra two and a half weeks. Um, I'll actually end up owing you money because you've, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, you've already paid well. for two weeks. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Oh, score. So, so that was great. So here's and to New Smyrna Beach. <laughs> New Smyrna Beach has been awesome. We are wrapping up our, we've been here, I think it'll be a little over a Four month. or five weeks, almost five Probably weeks. Almost five weeks. But we're set, it's a pending weather, which everything on a boat is, we're hoping to cruise north on Tuesday. Yeah, so we are watching weather and uh, we're, we've got one appointment left <laughs> to fulfill here, which is getting one of our bikes, brakes fixed. Uh, the parts are in, and so uh, get those fixed, and that gives us a lot more mobility. It's been great having the bikes back and operational. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, we're going to continue cruising up in North Florida. Um, got some stops planned, um, and mm -hmm. we're kind of have uh, decided.
decided we're probably staying in Florida through the end of the season. We're just really liking this slow cruising pace, yes. exploring these cities, and we're, uh, we're probably going to go down the St. John's River. Yeah, so St. John's River, we're starting to call ourselves sloopers for slow slow loopers. We are in no rush. We know, we know there are going to be people who lap us on the loop, and we are okay with that um, because we want to do all the side trips and we want to spend more time in the places. And um, Some people say the journey is the destination. And for us, no. <laughs> We, we've been in motion for 12 years, oh. over 12 years on stop, and we love being in motion, but we love being mobile. But we're also finding we're really liking this slower pace and getting to know the places we're going, becoming a regular at restaurants and getting to know people and getting to know the history of a place and immerse ourselves and be somewhere long enough to care about a place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's in... Yeah, but we, we kind of know when it's time to start moving on is when we start getting tired of our, our evening walks. And it's like, okay, been here, done that, been here, done that. Oh, we're going to the same restaurant for the third time, which means we like it, and that's great. But maybe mm. before we get to doing it at the same place for the fourth time, let's move on. Yeah, well, we have our regular dishes. Okay, no, no, we're getting a little too too set and <laughs> into a routine. Yes. But this has been a fabulous stop. Um, mm -hmm. It's just been great. Um, anyway... This was totally spontaneous to hang out tonight. We are really here. Um, if you guys have questions about cruising, about RVing, nomadic life, cats, um, feel free to ask them in the, the chat box. We'll be more than happy to fill yeah, questions this evening and hang out. Sunday, rainy Sunday hangout. Grab a beverage. We'll, we'll chill out for a little while. Um, and, yeah, it's always fun to hang out like this, so. Um, I know on the last video chat, people had asked how we find out about um, things to do in a town when we get there. And Ooh. first thing we do, we go find the little uh, kiosks. The little free newsstands that are stacked up everywhere. Oftentimes, like the Marine office has things like this on. Mm -hmm. And so you find the local, either the local paper, you know, maybe you have to pay 50 cents for it, or there's usually the free news and art weeklies. And <laughs> you flip through them for ads and whatnot, but you usually find what's going on <laughs> oh, <sorry>. um, <laughs> and you know often just also walk down main street and look for signs and bulletin boards and that's how we found out about just just the free right, concert yeah, series the, right on the other side of this basically right in front of our boat on the other side of a building is the downtown park where every thursday they have live music and it's been really good you know the um one last the band last week was phenomenal and the weekend before for, uh, the week before that, they had Nat King Cole's niece uh, was singing there, which was really yeah. cool. <laughs> yes. And um, and then a big festival for Fourth of July. We actually had the fireworks right over our boat here. The, the barge was basically straight out from us. Um, you know, all these little, nice little perks of being downtown. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so Chris says he missed the intro. Where are we at? We are in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, which is just north of the Space Center. In it's... fact, we've seen two night uh, launches yeah. of SpaceX. Oh, which wait, was that amazing. last night? Yeah, this actually, is morning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this morning. Early this morning. We got we got, we got stayed up late last night and watched the, the SpaceX launch. It was not nearly as spectacular as the Dawn one uh, a few weeks ago, which was insanely beautiful It was amazing. Launch. It had a north trajectory, so it went right past us. And the full moon... And it was the rising yes, I... sun combining the light oh, from both was sides just... was oh the the yeah it would look like mm -hmm. a dragon in the sky. So um, Pete had asked, "Is uh, so our city marina life here is better than when we're on the hard uh, <laughs> getting our boat fixed?" And being in Miami was awesome. I mean, having the access to a big town was awesome. Yeah. And actually, like I I would have and where we really wanted to be in Miami would be staying at one of the municipal marinas in Coconut Grove area, which is the section just south of downtown Miami. It is the you know, kind of the bohemian heart of Miami, funky, cool stuff. I actually had a, a job in high school or in college working in Coconut Grove. Um, and it's just a funky, fun place, part of Miami, and the marina's right there. But unfortunately, we were up on stilts uh, way up the Miami River underneath the, basically at the end of the runway of Miami run Airport. So didn't quite have that feel of just walk outside and you're in the heart of a city. <laughs> <laughs> Airplanes raining soot down on us instead. But, I mean, that was a unique experience. Yeah. And, and from there, we could walk to the Metro, Metro Rail and get anywhere in mm -hmm. downtown, which is cool. And because we were so close to the airport, all the Uber and Lyft drivers are, like, swarming in circles. Mm -hmm. You'd press a button for a lift, and, like, the car right in front of you would stop. You'd have, like, a 30-second wait. So we had pretty <laughs> decent access to stuff. It was just we were too tired to yeah. always take advantage of it. And it still wasn't walking distance, which is we really thrive on walking distance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, yes. we love things. Even in the RV, we like things in walking distance. Yes. And we have the car, and we will use it, but it and stays parked more often Walking or biking distance. And that, that, I, that is something I do wish um, it existed more in the RV world would be people investing in doing downtown urban RV parks. I would, I would love mm-hmm. to see that become a trend. Yeah, and I would love RV parks to have the appeal to a city to have close in town Mm -hmm. that Marina does. Um, So often RV parks in city centers are related to mobile home parks or trailer parks for more, um, Mm. I don't know, they just don't have the same access and vibe and they're not part of the town, if anything. They're kind of the low low, low rent housing, if anything. Now some, but now, but I have to give credit. Some small towns, particularly throughout a big chunk of the Midwest, do have municipal RV parks that are right in town. And actually, we've run across several of them that are free for visitors to come through. Mm-hmm. It's like free with hookups, even um, for stay two or three nights and patronize mm-hmm. our town and walk through our cool little small downtown. And those have actually been some of the neater RV park experiences yep, we've had definitely. in our years on the road. Strange little towns mm-hmm. in the middle of Nebraska mm-hmm. or South Dakota. And, Mm-hmm. One case we were walk, we were next mm-hmm. to a rodeo. Another time there was a demolition derby going on right next door. Cool. Fun, fun place to get to know <laughs> local communities yes. and cultures. Um, Rob would like to know while we're underway, do we maintain cell phone coverage? And um, so far, cruising in Florida, mostly we have been in very populated areas where we can see cell towers pretty much mm-hmm. the whole time. So it's very similar to RVing in Florida in that respect. Yeah. It was a challenge going through the Everglades and going down around the southern tip of Florida. And, but we still managed to get online. We had to pull out the boosters and the directional antennas when we did that. But coming up the east coast of Florida so far... Uh, we've been getting some of the fastest cellular service we've ever run across. I think I had oh, well over 100 megabits per second on both Verizon and AT&T the other day when I was testing, which is ridiculously fast. And mm-hmm. we've been streaming in 4K. Yeah, yeah. when we it. go down the St. John's River and we're going through the Ocala National Forest, apparently that there's some re- some areas yes. that uh, won't have great cell signal. And we're actually looking forward to that and mm-hmm. actually testing some of the marine antennas that we installed back in Miami uh-huh. uh, that we haven't really been anywhere we can use yes. them. And we got Papa Drews asking us about how do you empty the almighty black tank? I don't think docks have places to plug in your hose. And that marinas sometimes do, and we love it when they have at your slip pump outs. Like this marina we're at has a, it looks like an upside down flower pot, right? at the On our dock. And we can roll a cart down from down the dock and big cart with a giant hose, uncoil the hose, hook up the hose to the flower pot thing. There's a valve inside, set it up, and then we can pump out right here at our dock. And so we do that basically every two weeks. Yeah. Um, so on a boat that your black tank is usually underneath in the bilge area or in the engine room, which is ours. And there's a pipe that comes up and then there's an access hole that you open, you unscrew a thing and you put the pump into it and then it pumps it out. It's yeah, you have called to have a suction. So in RVing it's called dumping. You're actually physically pu- hooking up a hose with a connector that's going into a sewer system and yeah. you're physically you're just opening a valve and dumping. Gravity does the work in an RV in a, in a boat. It's um, pumping. It's a it's a motor that's doing it, which means they tend to it's a lot it's a lot more mechanically complex, which we've discovered it means they are much more often broken down. So we've been places where they're like, Oh yeah, pump's broken, we're waiting for parts, it'll be two weeks, three weeks um, like, ah, we, we actually were told at one point last year that the, the nearest place to pump out was 30 miles, uh, would have been a 30 minute, um, cruise away just to go find a place to empty our tank. So we, uh, um, re- resorted to shore facilities for a couple of days until the pumps were fixed. Mm-hmm. And, um, so they, the, just like in RV parks, you know, the amenities vary. Um, sometimes you have at slip or at campsite full hookups. Um, in this case, you know, we're rolling a cart over when we need to mm-hmm. do a pump out. We can normally go two weeks in between pump outs, which is it's really nice. It's very, in our RV, we can go three weeks in between dumps. Mm-hmm. Um, and then sometimes they just have a pump out dock. Maybe it's with a fuel dock if they also mm-hmm. have fuel service um, at the marina or the um, and you just have to pull in. At the last marina we did an extended stay at, all they had was a pump out station that was on there on an outer dock so when we needed to pump out we had to move the boat which just give me an an, an, you basically have to prepare your entire house for motion putter around it becomes a big hot sweaty chore because you know you gotta 
it, particularly if it's windy and it's a challenge to dock and stuff just to just to empty your tank so we really like the marinas that have at slip pump outs and we really like the ones that let you do it yourself on your own schedule and then yeah because other places they are like yeah they they do it you know, they might have it tuesday and thursday and you just let the the front office know that you will be ready and one of the dock hands will come by with the cart and help pump you, you out and if you're not there you miss it and we've seen others where they just come aboard and they'll, they'll pump you out yeah. um there are some places where maybe you're in a mooring field or an anchorage, um, like down in the Keys. They actually have a free service that's sponsored by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Service where they bring a pump-out boat to you and pump you out. It's kind of like the honey wagon concept mm-hmm. in RVing. Yep. And that was really convenient as well. Yep. Yeah, that was that was being sponsored as after the hurricane. But some, some municipalities have free sponsored um, pump out boats. Others you can pay, you know, ten or twenty bucks a, a time to do it, which is great. So that way you don't even have to come into a dock. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Next question from Carolyn says, "Are we paying attention to the tides on the ICW?" And um, the title, I mean, the tides because there's on the ICW is very interesting because all the inlets along of it. Uh, the tide changes as far as the currents that you're you're mm-hmm. either being pushed or pushing against them, depending and, upon where you are in relation to the inlet and the next inlet. Yep, and it also means that there's the, what had been a channel will turn into an island too. There are places where you know, actually happens, just just right out of New Smyrna Beach is a area where people go to party called Disappearing Island, which at low tide is a sandbar where people party and hang out, and at high tide is where people watch for the boats to run aground who don't realize there's an island hiding under there. So it's definitely Um, a navigational thing. Um, If we know that we're going to be passing an inlet, sometimes it's a lot easier to go through the... We're not going in and out of inlets because we're staying all intercoastal. We're not actually going out in the ocean. Um, But definitely if we were, that you want to time that more for slack so you're not fighting currents and, and going yeah. into washboard they can get really washboardy in the inlets yes. but even in the inlet when we're passing by them you don't uh, want too much current yeah it, it you there's a whole bunch of current flow coming in or out and it's a lot easier if you're going in at slack which yeah. slack is the time in which the the currents either the tides either at the high or the low and yeah, you know, it's, it's not mo- the water's not moving as much and that definitely makes a difference in docking how close your marina is to uh an inlet uh, will impact how much current from the tidal shifts mm-hmm. are, are happening. So we do pay attention to that when we are coming yep. into a marina. We'll read reviews and advice and talk to the dock master when we're booking it. Is, you know, is, is there a problem with currents in your marina and should we uh, time our arrival for slack? Yeah. There's actually in quite a few places that it's basically recommended is like, if you're here and it's not the ideal time, um, just throw your anchor and wait until, until slack tide, until the slack current so that you're not going to become entertainment and or damage potentially bump into other boats. Mm-hmm. So just wait wait for the window. You might have to sit and anchor for a couple hours, but do it. And then it uh, makes a difference in how you tie your lines because um, you know the mm-hmm. more tidal shift that you have, if you're on a fixed dock, so I, not a, we're on a floating dock right here and there's about a three foot tidal shift at this location. We're not noticing it much at all because our, our dock floats with us. So our lines, we're not having to adjust our lines all that much except for on our, the pilings, which are fixed. Um, but that makes a difference because you don't want to, you know, your lines pulling too much yeah. as you go down or, or up. So you're, you, but you want them to be not too long or else they're not going to give you the holding that you need. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely, yes, you pay attention to tides. So uh, Jeff wants to know what's our next stop. Do you want to say where we're going? Um, so we're generally heading towards Jacksonville at this point, and we'll, we'll probably pick out a couple of stops along the way. And then we're going to be heading down the St. John's river. It makes a U-turn. It's one of the few rivers that flows North. So mm-hmm. we're actually going to be going back almost all the way to Orlando to the town of Sanford is, uh, where the St. John's is as far as you can navigate, um, with a boat our size. Um, so yeah, and we're going to be taking that nice and slow. We have no idea exactly how long it'll take us to get to Sanford. Yeah, we'll take it nice and slow, find some stops along the way. We don't like to plan too far in advance because so many things on boating can impact um, your arrival, like weather, um, parts, mechanical right. issues. And, and we've been tackling projects. And, mm-hmm. you know, we like, like here we finished, we did the generator sound shield was a project we took on at this uh, marina. And stuff, yeah, so. and we did our own oil change on the engines, our first oil change doing all on our own, which was really cool mm-hmm. to be here. So, um. Not available, I'd like to know. How much do you cruise when on the boat versus driving when you're in the RV? Hmm. Um, 
I would say in the in the boat, we're definitely taking a much slower pace. So we're having less days that we're in motion. Yeah. That is for sure. But just because it just feels right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, it'll be interesting when we get back to the RV and we find our pace in the RVing if we also adopt, adopt a slower pace or not. But the places that we like to RV at, uh, which are public campgrounds, boondocking spots, tend to have a 14-day limit. So that kind of dictates... And, and that is a comfortable limit for not even having to stress with our tanks and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's like... Oh, and the pace, actually, we were kind of enjoying when well, last time we were out in the desert southwest is boondock for two weeks, come in and use the Passport America Park for two days, and you know, you're paying next to nothing, get full hookups, flush the tanks, do the laundry... Hopefully they have a swimming pool as well, and uh, and then go back out in the desert. But we'll see how it is, because now yeah. we are, are leaseholders at a, a RV park in a, in a co-op in Arizona. So we'll see if, we'll see see how it goes. But um, as far as the number of hours that we're in motion on a moving day, um, we're finding that it's more comfortable for us to cruise longer days. So we're comfortable more the four or five hour cruising day on the boat. Yeah. Yeah, cause, in the RV, that gets tiring. Yeah, because when you're on the on the road in the RV, you're buckled in a seat with your seatbelt, and there's really you can't do much else. Other, than, I mean, it's great. I enjoy driving. I enjoy the the scenic splendor of going down the road. But you're kind of locked in, literally belted in. Whereas when a cruising day on the boat, you're on the water. You're moving slow. You can pull out the binoculars. You can walk around. The the pilot in charge can actually hand over easily command yeah. of the vessel to the other pi yeah. pilot and take over. Uh, it's yeah, not pilot, as yeah. it's you're not as it's not you don't have that your attention doesn't have to be when you're moving at 55 miles per hour your eyes better be scanning every few seconds everywhere. Whereas on the boat it's more relaxing. The driver can actually walk away from the helm. For a little bit, as long as there's not a lot of heavy navigation yeah. going on. Yeah, particularly if, if you're on a, a wide open space, open passage, and you've got the mm -hmm. autopilot locked in, you can, you mm -hmm. can. Well, we we've we've made lunch while underway when we were cruising mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of Florida, where there was no other traffic mm -hmm. and stuff, um, which is great. It's just really fabulous. That's something that I really someday I, I look forward to having the Tesla RV and I can just press a button saying, "Hey, look, beat me when we get to the exit. I'm going to go back and take a nap." <laughs> Um, let's see. How is connectivity for our remote jobs? So our remote job is actually <laughs> teaching about connectivity. <laughs> right. We run the Mobile Internet Resource Center, um, which, and wrote a book on the topic, uh, the Mobile yeah, so Internet I, Handbook. Yeah, MobileInternetInfo.com is our, our day job and, and where we hang out and talk about all things internet related. And um, so, yeah, we, we tend to have really great connectivity just because we play with all the toys and have plans with every carrier and have had and know all the tricks and have, you know, and then we teach other people those tricks. Um, and yeah, so. So we tend to <laughs> have more connectivity than most do just because it's our job to test connectivity. Right. Um, but so far in cruising Florida, except for the Everglades, uh, we've had some of the most rocking uh, connectivity. Ridiculously good connectivity. Because Florida is so dense in population, especially on the coastal areas. And we're now kind of in the, the we've been a little bit on the off season lately, mm -hmm. where there, you know, we've been places that aren't super crowded, and therefore the towers are not saturated, and they're rocking fast. So yeah, we've been doing really good at connectivity lately. Um, but I do anticipate once we start cruising the St. John's, it's gonna we're gonna have some more sparse areas, which I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to. And uh, definitely as we go further up the coast, um, I, I hear along oh. the Georgia coast, yeah. North Carolina coast, you get you're getting away from population centers. Yes, and then it'll be very sparse, and mm -hmm. then we'll then we'll start to have get to more challenges, which we're looking forward to. Yeah, and yeah, we're yeah we're anticipating that the Great Loop intercoastal cruising that we're doing is gonna be very similar to if if you are RVing along the coast. So, mm -hmm. as far as connectivity wise. Um, do we have a black and gray tank? And I'm assuming on the boat, uh, our boat does not have a gray tank. Um, that was not the norm back in the yeah. day our boat was built. M most boats, um, your gray water just goes overboard. I think that's almost universal. Some have a, tre a treatment center if they're large enough. Yeah. Some do have a gray tank if they're in some enclosed water spaces where dumping your gray water is not allowed. Yeah, but... Almost all boats, your sink water and your shower water goes overboard, and your black water goes into a black tank. Mm -hmm. and, and our bus, we have both. Yeah. Uh, how do you find out about the marina facilities? Says Jeff. Um, I'm gonna grab the water for you guys. Okay. Yeah. So there's several resources, just like in RVing. Um, you've got Campendium, RV Park Reviews. You got All Stays. 
um, all sorts of apps and things that you can use to look up campground facilities. Very similar in boating. Uh, the ones that we use are the waterway guides, which they have a book for each section of our cruising area. And this has not just um, marina stuff. It is like full guides to where, what where to, to eat, where to walk, where to, where to dock. And then they have a website that goes along with it where you can interactively look at places on a map and... Um, they also see any alerts that are out, like a missing channel marker, um, shoaling areas, sunken boats, and things like that that you need to be aware of. So we always check that before we head out to see if there's any alerts posted. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one called Active Captain. Um, that one started out independently, but Garmin bought it. Uh, so they're now integrating that into a lot of the Garmin products. Yeah, but also Active Captain, even even under Garmin's control, is got an open SDK. So a lot of um, other apps have the Active Captain database as a layer you can put down um, and like see. Uh, Navionics doesn't, but well, probably will because Garmin bought Navionics as well. So actually, they have announced by the end of this year they're going to have Active mm -hmm. Captain on board. Um, we just downloaded an app called Aquamaps yeah. that has waterway guides and Active Captain integrated into one. Now, if you're an RVer, have you ever wished that you could have one map that showed <laughs> Campendium's database, Allstays database, uh, as well oh, as RV Parky, and maybe even integrating in some other data, like oh. Harvest Host or something? Yeah. And, oh. Yeah. So, so it's 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 nice to be able to just see all these different dots. Of course, then it makes it a little bit confusing because you've got to read. There's two dots for each marina, and it's like oh, two two pins. When you got to read the active captain entry and then go read the the waterway guide, and active captain tends to have a lot more reviews, a lot more reviews, but waterway guide does a better job of keeping current and throwing away old, out of date information and stuff. So you got to juggle them a little bit. And, um, yeah. yeah. Those are the main sources that we use. And then, of course, you know, there's once you get to know people in marinas, you use word of yeah. mouth. Yeah. We've, uh, you know, we've had other cruisers come through this marina the last month we've been here and we've connected with them. And it's not uncommon to say, hey, come on over and have a drink. And uh, you, you share places where you've been. And in RVing, when you cross up with another RVer, you know, you could have been coming from 400 different directions to meet up at the point where you just were. When you're cruising, more than likely, especially here on the ICW, they're either coming from the north down the ICW, from the south up the ICW, or they came across from the Bahamas. There's really not too many other paths that they took. So the chances are we have tips to share about where we just were that's going to help the next cruiser that we encounter. Yeah. And speaking of word of mouth, I just got texts from Bob and Diane who are watching us saying you'll love the Sanford Marina and avoid the covered slips because of bug dropping. So, hey, like you're, you're witnessing <laughs> word of mouth coming through by text message. So, hey, guys. Awesome. See, this is how we learn about marinas is right like that. <laughs> Make friends. <laughs> Um, what type of wine are we drinking this evening? And then we are using, uh, we're going with cheap wine tonight. Yes. Um, we're drinking a yellow tail and they had it on sale at Publix when we did our reprovisioning this afternoon. So we're doing a cab, uh, Syrah blend. This is kind of, um, we appreciate fine wines, definitely, <laughs> but we also appreciate wine. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so yeah, we're just doing a yellow tail tonight. We find that it's a good standard house wine that we keep on on hand i picked it because it was the top of the rack That's and i basically. didn't feel like digging because i was too busy running around trying to get the camera set yeah. up but she said 15 minutes till we're going to do a video <laughs> what <laughs> but yeah yeah we definitely appreciate all varieties of wine mm -hmm. um especially we like deep reds so is what we tend to do mm -hmm. uh cindy asked how did you learn about all this navigational stuff we're in the great lakes with no tides and we still have navigational issues you you are in ability areas all of the time how did you get the confidence um i i love map. i've always been a map geek forever so i've i've never had any unconfidence with navigation and also because i enjoy getting lost so, yeah but i don't know but boating the, does i mean yeah. you can't see the road right so yeah you've got <laughs> so you've got a um Learn to trust your equipment. Learn to learn. No, G, I mean, GPS revolutionized everything. Is you've got a dot on the map that it's pretty accurate. Yeah, you're not the, the dot is going to be accurate. You're not sure the map is accurate. That's that's a little bit of the catch. You're always double checking reality versus the map, and you have to, to be a captain and weigh the 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 you know what are you seeing? What's this? What's that? And learn your tools. Have more tools. You know, we we've just got a radar relatively recently. We're going to be learning how to integrate that into more and more of our navigation and stuff but 
Um, the nice thing on a boat is is just you can take it slow, and and just if if things are strange or confusing, take it slower and um and practice, mm-hmm. learn. I mean, go download the different, go on the boating forums, yeah, and see which apps and ways that people are using to navigate. Um, and and learn multiples actually because mm-hmm. when one is is not giving you good data or has a sudden problem, um, having you know we, we we usually keep two iPads plus a chart plotter going. Um, when and we we're have underway. and then uh, plus, the waterway well, guides has some paper charts paper too. charts so we have a backup system. Um, mm-hmm. We both are one way we yeah. gain confidence is we plan our travels together. Um, we both will maybe do our independent research and we'll come together and say, hey, I was reading about this one and, oh, you saw about this anchorage. But mm-hmm. we do it together so we both are aware because we both pilot the boat. We mm-hmm. both navigate. We yeah. And that's actually something we, we, we kind of learned um, out of necessity is, you know, we, we if, if I'd done all the homework and I'd like studied like what the bridge heights were and how we're going to, what bridges we have to call for the drawbridge to open and everything like that. And we hadn't discussed this in advance and we're like now in traffic and we're having to like, you know, juggle in front of the bridge. And I'm like, ah, Sheree, is this one that has to go up or down? And she's like, well, you didn't tell me about this one. I don't know. And I'm like, oh, my notes are downstairs. And it's like, it, it, Having we learned that, and now we're like, okay, let's always talk about our day's cruise in advance, so we both are on the same page, so that we yeah. can cover for each other, or I can go and find the information, right. or he can find the information that I've researched. So right. we collaborate, we make notes together in places that we can share. We have a shared um, Evernote's document where we put our cruising notes. So you know, like when we're, especially in South Florida, where you got bridge openings. Yeah. Does the this wazoo. open on the hour, or, or the is this one? Hour? Do we have to worry about this one with our height? Uh, we actually went and wrote out all the ones, highlighted the ones that we thought we would have to wait for, and the ones that we didn't think that we would have to wait for in time around, and knew what the bridge opening was, knew what the the channels were that we had to call to request an opening. Mm-hmm. So, and yeah, and then mostly just take it slow too. It's like mm-hmm. you know, if you're rushing, then you know you're probably doing something wrong. And if you're not confident with navigational and charting take classes go to if you're a power boater go to power squadron classes offered by the coast guard find a training captain who can train you we actually did four days of classroom training with captain chris in vero beach and they had kind of the basics of charting um and navigation they actually walked us through simulations of planning a day's cruise picking an anchorage in a marina and things like that and actually uh, on our on our recent cruise up this direction from down south we're like hey this hole in the wall anchorage. This is the one that Captain Chris has us pretend that we're plotting our our route to. It's like recognize this chart. Yeah. So. so you know, if you're not confident with something, find someone who is and hire them to train you. That's one thing we did. And you know, everything that we've done on the boat and in the RV, like we didn't just go and change our oil for the first time on our own. We hired a mechanic a year ago to do our first engine maintenance, but train us to do it as yeah. well. Um, so that's the way we approach things. Okay. Let's see. Question. We are full timers, um, RVing, heading west in a month, struggling to find BLM land for our RV. Are you aware of any site that shows without having to go to the site for each park? So, um, park and BLM land are diff- usually different. So, um, BLM land is boondocking. They don't have specific parks, um, that they're undeveloped. That's the whole point of boondocking is they're undeveloped sites. So they're not called parks. They're just BLM land. It might just be a dirt road that ends in a, a kind of a gravel lot, if that. Yeah, and a lot of the, the best BLM lands you're not going to find listed on sites. They're all spread word of mouth, or people find them and hunt them out. Um, know what the, the individual BLM laws are. We wrote an app called U.S. Public Lands that shows the... Uh, boundaries for all of the public lands so that you can use that in your research. Yeah, get a very high level look. But you're going to be scouting out on your own to find the good camping spots. Now you can go to sites like Campendium is one of our favorites. Um, all stays has some of them. So some of the known, uh, the publicly known popular BLM campsites, uh, they're not really sites, campsites, mm-hmm. they're just known locations. Um, I call those the low hanging fruit places and they can get very crowded sometimes but they'll they'll be listed there and you can get specific directions and they all have maps that you can use to find them Mm -hmm. and you can find information and tips like how's the cell phone connectivity you know is there nearby restaurants or 
shopping? Where do you go get mm -hmm. your groceries and things like that? Yeah. But those are the low-hanging fruit, and expect that those are going to be more crowded because you don't have to do a lot of effort to find them. Right. Yeah, we, 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 we have, and we know people who, who spend hours scouring satellite maps and stuff and trying to come up with, like, their ideal um, potential targets. They'll come up with, like, three spots that I think these are going to be great boondocking spots, and then they'll drive out in a Jeep and scout them out and say, mm -hmm. can my RV get here? And it might be a ton of effort, but once you get your RV there and you're the only person for miles and you got the panoramic view and, you know, wild animals running through, it's like some of our most magic time RVing has yes. been when we put the effort and into finding those And don't share spots. those on social media because then they get overused yes. and then you start having people leave trash there and then they get worn and yeah. you destroy what the beauty is of mm -hmm. some of these remote locations that are under not undiscovered but un yeah. undocumented yeah. and and actually uh, well other times you'll find places that have been over partied and you can go there and they're not being used anymore and you leave them cleaner than you found them which is yes. also a really great thing to yeah. do um, yeah. but yeah it's it's but word of mouth and a lot of homework and or go for the low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. uh, someone recommended uh, skipper bobs also for anchorages and yes. stuff and um, they're great. They're, Skipper Bob's was bought by Waterway Guides, and we have not downloaded that much because we are more online focused and finding online. So just having one resource, one book is enough for yeah. us. Yeah, we don't. We we have one printed thing. <laughs> we, we're we're not book people. We want it all online. Um, and I and I think they're going to be in, in, incorporating a lot of the Skipper Bob's data into um, into Waterway Guides. They're both their website and their books, and also there's. Um, a couple. I mean, there's actually quite a few online resources. Uh, there's people who share their tracks that they, they cruise mm -hmm. every year. There's people who do Anchorage and just share them in some of the various cruising forums. So you can do as much homework as you have patience for. Um, let's see. How far in advance do you plan your trips, either by boat or RV? We don't like to plan too far in advance. Particularly the details. Um, we'll maybe have a general route, like at the beginning of the summer, we thought we were going to be up to the Chesapeake by, um, by end of it's this. It's so windy. It's getting pretty windy. No, no, I'm like yeah. trying to think, trying to do anything with our no, bimini. I think we're fine. Okay. Um, but things change. So we don't like, uh, some people are very schedule oriented and they we, like having the plans. We have friends who have their reservations booked a year in advance and they know every spot they're staying months and months in advance and that would drive us nuts uh, because too many things in life can change weather mechanical delays illnesses falling in love with a place and wanting to stay longer or falling in love with a person and wanting to stay longer yeah, yeah that, that sort of thing too. happens too yeah so. um <laughs> and what we found is when we have too many things planned out number one it creates stress for us because now it feels like we have to be there or we have to commit to it or if we're not there we have a lot of reorganizing and rescheduling to have to do so we don't like to do that so we don't tend to plan our stops we have a general line that we're following, but we don't actually make reservations, research the details. We just do it kind of the one, next stop at the time. We have yeah. the, our next two stops. We well, do have a reservation. We have our reservation for our next stop, and we have a, a plan for the stop after that, and we haven't even thought about beyond that, other than we know roughly we're going to go to mm -hmm. Sanford. Yep. We call it, we, we kind of consider our planning method kind of like a hurricane track. You know, it's like you know, a week out. It's very broad. It might hit somewhere between Florida and North Carolina. <laughs> and then as you a get closer, out, like... triangulates in. So that's how we have found works for us. It allows us to embrace serendipity, wait for invitations to come. Like we would have probably never stopped in New Smyrna Beach. Oh, yeah. If it hadn't have been for a YouTube viewer, viewer just like you guys, uh, mm -hmm. Inviting us out to dinner to come yeah. here, and we yeah. ended up following along with. Yeah, we, we didn't know a thing about New Smyrna Beach. I'd, mm -hmm. I didn't even know what a Smyrna was. So you know, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, we okay. usually don't have the we we usually have the details of the next stop pretty much planned out, but that's about it. And we have intentions for everything else. Uh, let's see. Pete says, "Hey, I wanted to send you guys a tip." Oh, thank you. I have seen that other YouTube live videos, but not here. So. Um, I think YouTube has a option for super chat or something like that where you can pay to have your question prioritized in the list. We don't do that mainly because YouTube um, doesn't differentiate the income from YouTube from uh, app sales because they the Google Play it all goes to the Google Play Store and because we're app developers and we have um, apps in the Google Play Store that we have to split our revenue with 
our our developer partner it gets too complicated on the accounting yeah, for, for, for just a few, a few little <laughs> tips that would come in that would just be a little bit too much extra math on so our part. we have not enabled the youtube tips thing because of that because it would just complicate our accounting but, too much. but we do have a, a, a leave us a tip thing on the website at the yep. technomadia.com so, so go to technomadia.com bottom page there's a tip fund and we also do have a patreon site if you want to come and kind of be more engaged with us on a daily basis yeah, yeah we do two-way video chats with the patreons because mm -hmm. that's a smaller controlled audience which is fun so uh, that's patreon.com slash technomadia and another way if you can leave a tip since this is a good yeah, segue hey, is we buy do the shirt off our back <laughs> uh, we do currently have our uh, through the end of the month you can get our new technomadia shirt which is uh, just because why not is more fun than why um, those are on, uh, we have these available if you would like to have one uh, through the end of the month you can find out more about that at technomadia.com slash shirt yeah, basically just over one week left to get one of the shirts so yeah. if you're interested it's a yeah. very cool shirt it comes in a range of colors and styles and uh, yeah we're not pushing them real hard because we're not really about branding and that sort of stuff but for those who want it it's available okay. it's a limited time edition yep. we we basically wanted a boat shirt so we're, we're getting a whole bunch for ourselves for ourselves and if you guys want one you're welcome to one too <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of how we're viewing it uh hey geeks on tour hey guys hey, geeks on tour here uh, uh, Storm says my dad is trying to buy the sister boat. So there, there were about three thousand Bayliner forty-seven eighty-eights made. And so there's a lot of sister boats out there, but apparently they're they're very scarce right now because yes. someone made them popular. Yeah, somebody put up a YouTube video about why the Bayliner forty-seven eighty-eight is a great loop boat, and suddenly everybody else wants one. Oh, yikes! Mm -hmm. <laughs> our, our broker has warned us. He's like, we 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 we've, we've uh, raised the market. <laughs> Uh, Tracy would like to know, do we have solar panels up yet? How much energy do you draw daily? So solar panels on the boat. Um, so we were in process of getting those and lithium bat batteries yeah. installed the, in se last the, September. The, the day that the evacuation was declared for Marathon was the day we had already set aside and had scheduled with the solar installer and the canvas maker to finalize the project and the design. So Irma completely derailed our solar plans. And we just haven't gotten circled back to redo solar. You know, yeah, so the, the solar panels isn't the problem. It's we have to redo our whole Bimini structure. And so it takes lining up a place where we can have panels meet up with us and maybe some install help uh, with those, as well as a canvas maker to redo our Bimini. And getting canvas makers is incredibly difficult when you don't have plans. So yeah, canvas makers tend to be booked up months and months in advance. And that's just so far has not, we have not found the right person in the right place to figure out, you know, we had in marathon and a hurricane came along. Um, instead, what we've done for our power is, you know, we've recently tackled replacing our generator and now just putting a sound shield on it and stuff. So we've done a lot of electrical work and actually we've done a whole lot of other electrical work and now we can generate electricity and do it very quietly, yeah, but, but solar is still coming. Yeah. And we still have the original lead acid batteries. Well, not the original from the boat, but the ones yeah. that came with the boat when we bought it. Yes, they're uh, crappy batteries. They're crappy, they're just regular flooded lead acid batteries. Uh, we were about to do the lithium batteries here at this stop. Uh, we have them picked out with the company that we're working with to to get them. But when we went to put the order in, there's like, oh, there's a two week lead, a two month lead time on them. Like, they had to get them shipped from Europe, and it's like, oh, that's not going to work. So um, they had agreed to get them to a U.S. shipping center. And then we got to our next long stop. They could meet up with us, but that would be putting it into September. And we're planning to store the boat in October for the winter. And it just seemed incredibly stupid for us to install brand new lithium batteries and then put them in storage so we're going to tackle that in the spring we're going to try to get everything lined up <laughs> so that when we get back to the boat in springtime next year we'll get the lithium and hopefully solar done at that time hopefully mm -hmm. we'll encounter a canvas maker somewhere in central florida that we can make the arrangements and get that all done and do that before we start our cruising season again next year so that's the story i'm sticking with it <laughs> yep and maybe things will change yeah, who knows <laughs> Um, Terry asked, have you used a composting toilet on the boat? We've used a composting toilet in other people's RVs and actually on our boat as well. No, in other people's RVs, we've, we've, we've gone with the winds at their place. Um, on the boat, we would someday consider having replacing one of our heads with one um, just to have that flexibility, but it has not been a priority yet. Yeah, especially since pump outs, like we were talking earlier, can be temperamental. They tend to be broken more often 
just because there's so much more mechanically involved. Yes. We'd like to have a backup non-pumping needed system. Yep. So we, we are considering at a future point um, replacing one of the heads, maybe when one of them breaks or something, um, one of them, replacing one of them with a composting toilet just to have that flexibility. Um, on the RV, um, we haven't seen the need. We have a three weeks of capacity on our black tank on that one. And, our black tank goes forever. It's... And our impression of composting toilets for a couple who is using it full time is the you have to change it out every three weeks anyway, so it really wouldn't buy as much. And we have to dump our gray tank anyway, so yeah, uh, and the yellow tank. You have to deal with the yellow tank. So so on the RV we're not tempted, but on the boat we're thinking about one of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Are you talking about his Gone with the Winds yes. joke? Yes, it's true. We have Gone with the Winds. They invited us over. Try out their toilet, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the winds are awesome. Yep. Um, amazing what they're up to over there now in French Polynesia over Tahiti right now. We're, we're, we're planning our, our rendezvous with them. Um, the timing is probably going to work out. We're going to finish the Great Loop about the time they finish the Great Circle of the World. Of the world. Um, and Maybe we'll, we'll meet be... back up in Florida. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do miss them terribly. We used to um, uh, caravan with them quite a bit, and very dear friends of ours. And I do miss meeting up with them, especially now that we're both on boats, and we haven't managed to meet up in our boats. Oh. <laughs> so <sad. sighs> All right, guys. If there's any other questions, feel free to shout them out. If not, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up. Um, we've been chatting for about 50 minutes so far, but like I said, this was just a spontaneous. We were bored this evening and decided to, to talk about uh, whatever we talked about. Yeah. Hey, and uh, here's here's to Nikki and Jason if they ever get around to watching this video. I know. Like we know they're, they're we know they're way behind on their streaming. But I don't think they have the, the internet uh, in French Polynesia is tricky. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, our, our summer will be pretty much in Florida. So. Yes. Hopefully the hurricanes stay away. And we'll be inland. That's that's one thing is we. In our analysis of things, was I we felt safer being inland in Florida than we did along the coast on the Atlantic because yes. more than likely we wouldn't have gotten with the delays in Fort Pierce and just our own desire to take a slower pace. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't see getting much north of maybe Charleston this year, and that just felt maybe just a little slightly less risky <laughs> of a hurricane impacting us. Yep, so fingers crossed, no hurricanes. And we'll be back in the RV in probably October, November time frame. And yep, yep, that's the plan is uh, we'll find some place to store the boat sometime. And our RV is waiting for us in Austin, and we need to get it. Our, our next big RV destination is we're intending to be at the Escapers New Year's Eve party in Quartzsite. So New Year's Eve, Quartzsite, get there from Texas. Uh, Pete says, is there any way of getting more notice of an online event? We literally <laughs> planned this 15 minutes before we went yes. live. So normally we, we try, we, we've lately gotten around to a day or two or three. Yeah. So our nor we try to do at least one of these a month more planned and have three or four days of lead time. Our Patreons get first notice. So if you want to join us over on Patreon, we do put out a notice as soon as we schedule them. But sometimes we're spontaneous because that's who we are. Because it's raining and, and you... She was like, I don't feel like making a produced video. Let's just go live now. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry. You're not going to get more notice of that. That's just who we are. Yes, but a lot of other times there'll be plenty of notice. Yeah, so. basically we hadn't, I hadn't have time to put out a produced video this week. And I'm being uninspired to do the produced videos because it's the summer and not as many people are watching videos. So it's kind of like, why put the effort? right now and to produce videos so i'll just kind of wait until the the True. viewing season picks up yeah that's a good point it's like yeah the last video a lot of people said it was a, one of the best videos ever but it's also just youtube in general is not a lot of people are watching right now mm -hmm. so it's like okay well fine we'll, we'll save it <laughs> <laughs> um so there's a question about oh. what charts and books we carry with us um we actually just covered that in the video brian so if you want to go look at the um yep. the archive of this when we're done we actually covered our navigational methods that we're using. Yeah. Uh, Terry says, I've been uh, looking for a boat similar to Why Not. Uh, yeah, the pricing seems to be going up. Yes. <laughs> yes. A, yes. Um, yeah, it, that, that is the case. So actually, if you look for some of the more other style of boats, maybe the price is going down. There, there could be a know. little bit of a... Uh, cause and effect. And Fernando, there's a lot of different great styles of boats out yes, there. Too. Fernando asks, what about the Meridian Pilot House 48 versus our boat? So basically when uh, in 2002, Bayliner 
quit making the 4788 model, which is what we have. And Meridian was another owned brand by the same parent boat company. Well, they, that's when they launched the Meridian brand. Okay. Right? Yeah, but so it was all the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. They moved it to the Meridian brand so that um, it could be marketed as a higher-end yacht because Bayliner had gotten a bad reputation well, for their recreational style yeah, boats. So, th so this, this, our boat was the, 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 this series. They had a several different sizes of it. The series of Pilot House motor yachts from Bayliner was the highest end of Bayliner's products, which went all the way down to the cheapest, most basic boats you could possibly buy for just day fishing and stuff. And some of those low-end boats had a deserved, apparently a very deserved bad reputation. And so... Bayliner is thinking, hey, let's just peel off our top top of the line and launch a new brand, Meridian, so that it's not associated with the lower end bo boats. And in the process, the, they launched the Meridian 4, 490 or whatever, the, the, the Meridian brand version of this boat. They changed the wood out. They changed a few other cosmetic things, mechanically identical, and they upped the price dramatically to be more of a premium Branded so they're, price. they're they're just as good, probably better, a little bit better than the forty seven eighty eight. There's trade offs actually. Some 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 things are a little bit worse. Some yeah. things, yeah. But you'll pay probably pay a lot more because the people who bought them spent two or three four hundred thousand dollars more than they did for a forty seven eighty eight just for the name Meridian. Yep. So. And then they only made it for a couple of years too. Is the Meridian? Yeah. Meridian is uh, actually I think they're finally shutting down the brand. I, I, I don't know I don't exactly know. the story, but yeah. There, there's but I a, think I think the Meridian. 40, the version of this one was only made from 2003 to 2008, if I remember my history. There was a guy online, Blake, somebody. He was um, a big dealer for the Bayliner 4788 yeah. or, or broker. He has a website called meridianpilothouse.com where he has like the entire history of these boats documented. And, so. and he'll t tell you about the changes that happened every year and what went this way, what went that way. So mm -hmm. you can decide in a way what year is the, mm -hmm. the compromises that most right. fit you. Right, and the the ninety nine was a good compromise for us. Mm -hmm. It, I was probably interested in going from a, a ninety nine to a two thousand two. Yep. Was what we were looking for. Yeah. Uh, Somebody's birthday's coming up. Yes, my birthday's coming up in just a couple weeks. Yep, we we, we know where we're going to be for it now. Hopefully, yeah. Yep. I, I was actually booking the play that we're going to go see that yeah. night. Yep, so we're going to go see a play in a nearby city. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Geeks say they owe us dinner again. So the Geeks on Tour, <laughs> um, they have been so sweet. Um, when they're, they speak at a lot of the RV conferences. Because they are the Geeks on Tour. And and we don't like to go to the RV conferences and speak. So, hey, perfect. Let them but do But they it. love it. And they speak up. If you ever catch them, they are wonderful presenters on technology for travelers and documenting your stuff. But whenever they're going to a conference, they send us an address and we ship them a box of books. And they actually offered the mobile internet handbook for sale at their uh, booth at the, at the, they were just at the FNCA rally in uh, Gillette, Wyoming. That's how I know where they are, because they show me addresses. So yes. they're <laughs> awesome. We just send them the books and they sell them. We tell them to keep the money. So. And they buy us dinner every so often. Works out. out. Perfect, because we get geek time. So that's yeah. awesome. So yeah, if you guys are coming back through Florida, Chris and uh, yeah, you, uh, we're not moving very fast, so you, we're we're not going to be you, you'll be passing us at some point. So yeah, let's meet up when you're coming back into Florida this season. All right, guys, we are going to turn off the camera, resume our evening. I'm yeah, going to find out. Uh, it sounds like something's broke loose up there, blowing in the wind. So okay, so maybe out. we need to go check our check our bimini. <laughs> yep. All right, guys, <laughs> thanks for tuning in on this spontaneous evening. Uh, enjoyed it. Remember, the t-shirts are available through the end of the month. Uh, that's at technomaddy.com slash shirt. And um, no pressure to buy those. Um, if you want one, you're welcome to. It's kind of how we're making them available. And um, I just saw a question come in is, why did we choose a cruiser versus a traditional houseboat? Because houseboats would be not good for... House, yeah, houseboats aren't suited for the intercoastal waterway. And, oh, and, but, and well, for it, open waterways. Well, for the open waterways. A lot of the places we intend to go, you want a boat that can handle a little bit of rough water. And a yeah. houseboat is not that. Yeah. And anyway. also, they're not built as well. So. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. <sighs> good night. See you guys later. Hello, and and uh, have a great week ahead. <laughs> Stop the stream. Here